All right, it is four o'clock, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today for our first ever anti-cancer lifestyle program webinar. Uh, today's topic is food and you gaining control over out of control eating. So before we get started, I just wanna go over a few housekeeping items. So all the callers will be muted. If you have questions, you should see a little Q&A um, tab at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, try uh, hovering your mouse over the bottom and you sh it should, should pop up for you. Um, if you have to drop off early uh, or if you wanna watch the webinar again, we'll be sending an email with the webinar recording and any relevant links once it's over. Um, if you're on social media, feel free to give us a follow. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and we try to post a lot of helpful tips and tricks. So just a little bit about anti-cancer lifestyle before we get started. So the anti-cancer lifestyle program is a comprehensive online lifestyle transformation course for cancer survivors and those who seek to reduce their risk of cancer and other chronic illness. So once I'm uh, done, I will send you guys a link in the chat box so you can check out our website. Um, so if you're interested in taking the anti-cancer lifestyle course, uh, we have specific areas around diet, fitness, change, mindset, and environment that help you reduce your odds of getting cancer and other chronic illness. Um, so I will again send that link out once um, we are done today. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and make introductions actually, but before I do that, I kinda of wanna make sure that everyone on here can hear me okay. So if you guys can find the chat box and type in where you're calling in from, I will read a couple of them out just to make sure that you guys can hear me. And so you guys know where the, the chat box is. Okay, so we have Boulder, Colorado, uh, New Hampshire, Charlotte, North Carolina, Tennessee, Long Island. Okay, awesome. So you guys can hear me. Perfect. So I am Seema Tucker and I am the Marketing and Development Director at the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program. And today we have Crystal Cassio, who's going to be our main presenter. And Crystal is a registered dietitian, nutritionist, and health coach who is passionate about anti-cancer living. After graduating with her BS degree in nutrition from University of New Hampshire, Crystal went on to pursue her MS degree in nutrition from NYU. She also received an advanced practice credential in integrative and functional nutrition and has completed a health coaching training program approved by the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaching. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Crystal. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Seema. Um, before I get started, I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me. So if you could maybe do a quick type in the chat box that you can hear me okay, that would be greatly appreciated. And Seema, if you could let me know um, that the audio sounds good, that'd be great. All right, so yep, everyone, you're getting a thumbs All right. up. All right, awesome. So today what we're gonna be talking about is um, a topic that is one, something I'm so extremely passionate about, and that's gaining control over out of control eating. So feeling out of control around food. Um, I'm gonna go through throughout this presentation, a bunch of tools, education, resources that are, that's going to help you feel less out of control when it comes to food and eating to help you improve your overall eating habits. So one thing we're gonna dive deep deep into is using the hunger fullness scale and that's going to help you tune into your hunger and fullness levels before during and after meals we're going to talk about the importance of reconnecting to the pleasure and satisfaction of the eating experience to avoid feelings of deprivation and i'm going to talk a lot about why feeling deprived um, and having those feelings of deprivation around food can actually be very counterintuitive to trying to feel in control of your eating habits. I'm gonna teach you how to honor your hunger levels to avoid feelings of extreme hunger. And we're gonna dive deep into why feelings of extreme hunger can actually promote feeling out of control with our eating. And we'll also talk a lot about practicing mindful eating techniques, the benefits of mindful eating and how practicing mind mindful eating can help you take control of your eating habits. 
So before we dive into all of that, um, something I just want to start off by talking about is the role of nutrition when it comes to minimizing our risk for chronic health conditions, including cancer, but also other chronic health conditions as well. That includes cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, autoimmune conditions, digestive issues, the list truly goes on. Nutrition plays such a huge role in helping us minimize our risk and do what we can to promote healthy living. So I'm going to share some statistics with you about nutrition and cancer and the importance of um, considering our eating habits and nutrition when it comes to minimizing our risk for cancer and cancer recurrence. So According to the World Health Organization and American Institute for Cancer Research, it's estimated that up to 50% of all cancer cases, cases can be prevented or are preventable. Diets high in fruits and vegetables may protect against certain types of cancer. And they, the literature also has found that maintaining a healthy body weight along with a healthy diet reduces cancer risk. Now, I want to be very clear. When I say a healthy body weight throughout this presentation, and I may also refer to um, healthy body weight as one's natural healthy weight, I'm referring to not the way society um, has told us we should look or a lot of what we see in the media, but I'm really, I want to hone in on the fact that it, due to our genetics and many factors, each of us, a healthy body weight looks very different um, on each and every one of us. And usually it's not one number, not one BMI, which is body mass index number, or even range. It's not one weight based on our height. Um, a lot of times we have a healthy weight range that our body likes to be at that's genetically predetermined um, where we are our healthiest self. So I am not referring to, um, you know, thinness as the ideal. And I really want to acknowledge that a healthy body weight looks different on everyone. So according to the American Cancer Society, we know that more than four in 10 cancers and cancer deaths have been linked to modifiable lifestyle risk factors. These risk factors include um, having excess body weight, poor dietary choices, smoking, uh, physical inactivity. And we know that excess body weight has been linked to risk, uh, risk for certain types of cancer as well. Eating fruits and vegetables has also been linked to certain types of cancer, specifically cancers of the oral cavity, of the pharynx, larynx, also um, lung cancer. And specifically for colorectal cancer, there's actually a lot of research that shows an association with specific aspects of one's diet to risk for colorectal cancer, um, such as intake of foods high in saturated fats, like red meats, for example, um, in a diet low in fiber. So all of this information, although extremely important, can make it very easy to succumb to restricting and dieting and foster a lot of food fear, um, worry around food, and can affect our relationship with food and our food choices. And I would argue that healthy eating is not just about eating food to nourish our body, food that's high in nutritional value. Healthy eating is so much more than that. It also involves having a healthy relationship with food. And sometimes when I say that to my clients or individuals I work with or I'm having conversations with, people might look at me like, Crystal, what are you talking about? What is having a healthy relationship with food? What does that look like? Well, I can tell you what it doesn't look like, and it doesn't look like having a lot of guilt around eating and eating choices, feeling shame based on what we're eating, um, feeling like we're morally good, um, we're good or bad based on our food choices. So if you've ever had the experience or have maybe yourself or heard people talking about how they ate something and they were good that day, quote unquote, or they ate something and they were bad that day. Um, so removing this more morality surrounding food. So this begs the question, how do we minimize our risk for chronic health conditions such as cancer, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, et cetera, while also lessening feelings of being out of control with our eating, along with feeling preoccupied with food, um, guilty, and stressed when it comes to eating? I'll give you a hint. It doesn't start with dieting. 
So we know diets do not work. And in a moment, I'm gonna go into a lot of the evidence of why diets do not work and why just the process of dieting can actually cause you to be more or to feel more out of control with eating. And I hope this, this, you know, hearing me say this is almost ho hopefully you're sighing in relief. Um, it's, it's good news because in reality, we, who wants to be on a diet for the rest of their life? I know I wouldn't, and I would never want that for my, my clients. So just some facts about dieting. We know, and you know, from the literature, this is proven, that most dieters, 95% of all dieters, will regain their lost weight in a matter of one to five years, if not more. So research has found that individuals who have a history of dieting or who are actively dieting, they actually are at an increased risk for gaining more weight than when they first started. And this leads to something called weight cycling, which I'm gonna to get to in a moment, which is actually really detrimental to our health. So we know that also all of these um, program, these weight loss programs and advertisements um, make use of false claims. And there's so much out there, even, you know, social media has taken off and there's so many influencers out there that maybe don't have backgrounds in nutrition or health or proper training that are giving advice and maybe making false claims. So we really have to be careful. It's important to keep in mind that the weight loss industry is a $72 billion industry that we're talking about. So it is a business. And you know how I mentioned just a, a little while ago that the process of dieting can actually cause out of control eating? This is partly because dieting can increase your cravings and urges for certain foods. And I should have mentioned earlier, when I say dieting, um, I'm really referring to, you know, many of you might be thinking of uh, a strict diet or eating plan that you might have heard of or maybe even have followed. Um, but really, it's a way dieting is restricting um, how much we're eating to where we're taking in less than what our body needs to function optimally. It's also when we're cutting out, um, cutting out major food groups can be a for form of dieting. Major, major categories of food. Um, like for example, cutting out all carbohydrates is a form of dieting, even though someone might not feel that they're on a diet. And dieting is a starvation at the biological level, which actually leads to some damage, some biological damage that I'm gonna discuss. So by dieting, we're actually causing hormonal changes in the body that make us more likely to retain more fat so it's almost counterintuitive than compared to what a lot of people are hoping for when they diet. Um, it could slow our rate of weight loss because it actually lowers our metabolism, which is a good thing for survival. So our bodies are brilliant and they're meant to survive. They want us to survive. So if we're really restricting our food intake, cutting out major categories of foods, then the body sees that as we're starving and we have lack of access to food. So what is it going to do? It's going to lower our metabolism, cause hormonal changes to make us prone to retaining more fat so that we're able to, to survive through the famine, even though in today's day and age, um, especially in this country, food is you know, where food is available. Whereas in the old days, the hunter-gatherer days, when we didn't have access to food and there were periods of starvation, um, we had to hunt for our food, it was the body's way of surviving. So what happens is, is we start to have more binges and cravings from dieting. So we see this a lot with individuals and my clients that I've worked with who have the history of dieting and then they quote unquote fell off the wagon or quote unquote failed their diet. Um, and then they end up binging or eating a lot more of the foods that were restricted on the diet because they felt um, that they were depriving themselves. And we're going to talk more in a moment about feelings of deprivation and why that's extremely hard, harmful. So another biological damage that dieting causes is it actually leads to weight cycling, which is extremely harmful for our health and well-being. Weight cycling, in simple terms, is really just having large variations in your body weight over time. So for example, um, 
like if you ever went on a diet and lost a lot of weight and then gained the weight back, that would be an example of weight cycling. And if we have a history of dieting or restricting and then um, going back to our old ways of eating or, you know, feeling like we failed the diet and then binging, what happens is, is we tend to have, um, like I've worked with so many people who have just years of weight cycling where they're constantly on this vicious cycle with dieting, losing the weight, and then gain it, gaining it back. And research is showing that that's more harmful to people than if they just stayed at their initial weight before they started dieting. That's how harmful it could be. Um, also, what happens when we diet is we become more disconnected to our bodies. Our bodies have this really beautiful system of telling us, um, it's almost thinking, think of it as a natural way to portion control. We're going to talk a lot about hunger and fullness in a moment, but it truly is the body's way to tell you when it's had enough at the biological level, when it's full, when we have enough nutrients, um, and when we need nutrients, getting hungry. Now, when we diet, we're actually making our food choices largely based off of for external reasons, you know, when, when we should eat, whether it's a time, what we should eat, and it makes us less in tune with our bodies and our true signals. And in many cases, dieting actually causes us to, or causes our bodies to change, um, so our body shape, to change away from our natural healthy body weight. So I see this a lot in the clients I work with that have a history of dieting. Um, you know, what happens is, is we, a lot of times people will come to me and they're coming and they're saying, oh, you know, I couldn't stick to the, this way of eating, but I was doing so good and now I'm not. And they'll allude to maybe how they used to look and, oh, I want to get down to this weight or I want to look how I, I did. And what's more important to me is not so much what weight they were at or how they looked, but is trying to see what were they doing? What were the behaviors that got them to that point? And in many cases, more often than not, it was severely restricting their food intake um, to the point where they were actually getting less than they biologically needed to survive or to live optimally. Um, so their body was going into that starvation mode. And a lot of times I noticed over-exercising um, and that's actually harmful to the body too. So sometimes from dieting, we have this fantasy of what we think our healthy body looks like when in reality, our healthy body weight range may look different from what we perceive. So aside from biological damages that dieting causes, dieting also causes emotional damage. So when we diet or severely restrict our food or have all these food rules around what we should and shouldn't be eating, what's good and bad, this could cause increased stress. And we know stress has been negatively impact. Um, excess stress has, have, has a negative impact on our health and well-being. It could cause us to feel like we have failed. Um, I see this a lot in, in those clients who people I've worked with who fall off diets and they come to me feeling so bad, like they failed, like it was a matter of their willpower, that it was something about them. When in reality, it has nothing to do with them. It has more to do that the, with the simple fact that diets don't work. The research, research told, tells us that. Um, it could lower our self-esteem, cause social anxiety, especially if we're invited out to eat with family or friends. Um, I think of holidays and if, we're ha if we have a lot of um, very inflexible ways of eating, this can actually cause social anxiety and stress. Dieting can actually cause us to feel loss of control and promote feeling out of control with our eating, um, specifically not trusting ourselves around certain foods, especially those foods that are forbidden or not allowed when on the diet. It can increase our risk for eating disorders and disordered eating which is a huge issue in this country. Um, it can impact our self-confidence, our trust in ourselves. And again, it could cause these perceived character flaws. So we can't really talk about out of control eating without continuing to talk about deprivation. I can't stress this enough. When you are deprived of something, your desire for it will increase. So the simple idea that food could be banned 
can even promote overeating. So to give you an example of this, um, this could be like if you're saying to yourself, hmm, next month I'm not going to eat these foods. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to cut these out. I see this a lot with sugar, like I'm just going to cut sugar out. And sometimes that threat of deprivation, even though you might actually be eating sugar at that point, um, that threat of deprivation can cause you to eat more of those sugary foods in that month that you're allowing yourself to, yourself to have them than you would if you just allowed yourself to have these foods um, and didn't put these restrictions on them. So this is basic psychology. I could give you an example, another example of this that doesn't have to do with food. So as you're watching this webinar, if I told you, try not to think of a big pink elephant in the room right now watching this webinar with you. What are you gonna think of? Probably a big pink elephant watching this webinar with you. Um, so, you know, when we tell ourselves that we shouldn't have something, we can't have something, something's bad, it actually could cause you to, to want it more. So many of you might have experienced this before. We call it the last supper effect. Um, so a lot of times what happens when we diet and even just the thought of dieting, again, oh, next month or next week, I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z. Um, this threat of deprivation can lead to the last supper effect where we overeat foods that we know we might not have access to or might not allow ourselves to have. So it almost becomes like this vicious cycle. Um, I see this a lot. I call it the throwing in the towel effect or the what the heck effect when someone says, oh, you know, I told myself I wasn't going to eat this and I did. And now since I ate it, I just failed. And then they just go all in and they just binge on that food or eat a lot more than they would if they weren't restricting that food. And this becomes a vicious cycle. So overeating almost serves as proof to yourself that you need to diet or you need to restrict this food because you can't control yourself and then you feel out of control and then this affects your self-esteem you feel like you failed that it's your lack of willpower and then this can promote overeating and then it can make you feel the need to go on a diet and it becomes this really really um, hard to break vicious cycle so where to begin? If we know diets don't work and we want to um, make peace with food while honoring our health and minimizing our risk for cancer and other chronic health conditions, where do we begin? One of my favorite tools to use, if you've ever worked with me, um, I use this with all of my clients, is the hunger and fullness scale. So it probably comes to no surprise that many of us eat for reasons other than hunger, which I want to add is normal. We might eat because we're stressed, because we're excited, happy, bored, out of habit, for many other reasons. We also participate in a lot of distracted eating. So eating in front of the TV or at work while we're, try we're trying to crank some things out or on the phone or while reading. And what happens is, is when we're participating in distracted eating and we're not fully present for our eating experience, it makes it really hard to tune into our hunger levels, our fullness levels, and also how satiated we feel. And there's something called taste satiety. You might have experienced this before where um, the first couple bites of something are usually the best tasting. They're the most flavorful, um, just the most pronounced. And then as you continue eating, it starts to taste different. So the first three bites probably taste different than, you know, the last, you know, the, your 15th bite or the near the end of the, the food or the eating experience. When we participate in distracted eating, it makes it really hard to start to notice when the taste of foods diminish. So if we're eating while watching the TV, or while watching TV, the as we continue to eat, that 15th bite might still, you might still feel like it tastes the same as the first bite, but that's only because you haven't really been paying attention to what you're eating. Whereas maybe if you were just fully present and not distracted and tuning into the taste along with your other, um, the other sensations that you're experiencing when you're eating, you might not feel the need to eat at all because it might not taste as good as you keep going. 
you know, not in not in all cases, but in many cases when we're paying attention more, we tend to eat less. And we're going to talk a lot about mindful eating in just a moment. So the hunger fullness scale, what is it? So it's a scale from one to 10 and one is ravenous. So if you're a one on the hunger fullness scale, you are so hungry that you're you're starving, you feel weak, nauseous, shaky, dizzy, lightheaded, you probably can't concentrate, um, and it's not a good feeling. Like, all you're thinking about is food. I like to call it hangry, sorry about that, um, so hungry that you're angry. So that would be a one. A two is you're very hungry, you're feeling maybe irritable, anxious, the feeling of wanting to eat everything in sight and needing food pretty fast. So when you're a two, it's not a very pleasant feeling either, and you're pretty hungry. When you're a three on the hunger fullness scale, you're hungry, but you're not yet uncomfortable. So this might even be like a pleasant hunger. So you're looking forward to eating. Your body's giving you signals that you need food. Maybe your stomach's growling. Maybe your focus is waning. Your energy might be going low. Everyone's body signals will be a little bit different. So our bodies like to tell us things um, in different ways, and that's not going to be the same for everyone. So it's important to think about how do you feel when you start to get hungry, when you start to get full and satisfied. So when you're a four, you're slightly hungry, some mild signals occur that tell you your body needs food, but you can wait to eat. Um, you have a little, a little time before you, you feel like it's time to eat. A five is neutral, so neither hungry nor full. A six is when you're filling up, but you're still comfortable. You can eat more, but you're physically full. Your body biologically doesn't need any more. You're full. A seven is when you're full, you're not yet uncomfortable, and the hunger is completely gone, and you also feel satisfied at this point. An eight is when we start to get a little bit too full. So we start to feel uncomfortable, maybe we loosen our belts a little bit. A nine would be maybe when we unbutton the pants, feeling very stuffed and uncomfortable. And then a 10 is that like Thanksgiving dinner full, feeling sick and extremely uncomfortable. A good rule of thumb, and I don't even like saying rule because I don't want you to think of this as just another food rule. I want you to think of it as a tool. So we'll call it the hunger fullness scale and using it as a tool. So something that you could do is try and eat when you're at about a three or a four. So when you're at that, when your body's starting to tell you you're hungry and it's a pleasant hunger, so you're not waiting until you're ravenous to eat, you're honoring that hunger as soon as your body's telling you that it's time to eat. So eating when you're a three or a four, and then consider stop, stopping eating when you get to a six or a seven. So when you start to feel full and satisfied, but it's not an uncomfortable fullness. So something that could be helpful, um, I think we've all been there when we've, um, you could probably recall some moments when you might have noticed that, hmm, I'm full, I don't need more, but then you keep eating, and then maybe you get to that uncomfortable fullness point. We've all been there, completely normal. Um, maybe practicing something to try and honor that decision that you made. So once you decide in your head, I'm I'm comfortably full and satisfied, maybe putting a napkin on the dish, putting the fork down, um, pushing the dish away. If you're at a restaurant, asking um, for them to wrap it up so you could bring it home as leftovers. So taking an action to reinforce what you decided. Now, there's a lot of things that impact our hunger and fullness levels that I'm not going to get into too much in this webinar, but I do really want to mention a very important point that it is completely human and normal to sometimes have moments where we went too long without eating and now we're ravenous. And it's also completely normal to sometimes eat until the point where we're stuffed or over full. I could almost guarantee that at some point throughout the rest of your life after this webinar, that's gonna happen and that's okay. Treat each eating experience as a learning experience. So, you know, don't feel guilty if you overeat or maybe if you wait until you're ravenous to eat and then maybe you overeat. Um, you know, we want to try and practice this without 
judgment. So being as non-judgmental as possible and just learning from our experience. So if you do notice, wow, I was I waited until I was ravenous to eat. Think about maybe what caused that. What in your day happened? How were you feeling? Um, what led you to that point? And then how did that impact you? A lot of times if we wait till we're really hungry to eat, we tend to overeat and eat very fast. So seeing what, um, you know, seeing how that experience impacted you. So I do want to mention that if you find yourself feeling like something's missing, even when you feel comfortably full, you may want to consider something very important, which is the satisfaction factor. And this is where reconnecting to the pleasure and satisfaction of the eating experience becomes instrumental. So there's this quote that I love, um, make all activities pertaining to food and eating pleasurable ones. It probably comes as no surprise to you that in the United States, food is often seen as the enemy. Um, that's largely when we think about just even media influences, the diet industry influence, there's a lot of food fear. Um, and there's a lot of information on nutrition. However, the, as we talked about in the beginning, the aspect of nutrition and healthy eating that doesn't get talked about enough is really having that healthy relationship with food um, and not feeling this guilt, preoccupation, um, or shame surrounding food and really you know, honoring that pleasure and satisfaction from eating. So obtaining pleasure and satisfaction from eating is one of the gifts of existence that we all deserve to experience. So when you're allowing yourself to feel satisfied, it actually can decrease your food cravings later on. So it can help with portion control. So how do we become more satisfied? Well, a good place to start is by preparing meals that attract all of the senses. So meals that look good, that taste good, that smell good. There's nothing less satisfying than when something's served to you and it looks like mush or doesn't look good at all, or maybe smells really bad. Talk about not a very satisfying experience. Uh, food quantity also decreases when you allow yourself to have pleasure and satisfaction in meals. So here's my step-by-step -step guide for you on how do we regain pleasure in eating again. So step number one, ask yourself what you really want to eat. Once you decide what you really want to eat, honor that and have it. Don't think about how you're going to burn it off later or how many calories it has. Really be present in that experience. And we're going to talk about mindful eating in just a moment to give you tools on how to do that. So discovering the pleasure of the palate is step two. So being sure that what you're eating is pleasurable, maybe even experimenting to see what kind of tastes you like. Step three, make your eating experience more enjoyable. Maybe making a more pleasant eating experience. Um, one thing I always encourage is avoiding tension at the table. Talk about a not very enjoyable eating experience when you know, you're bickering or arguing, so trying to make it very pleasant. That might even mean mixing it up and having variety, so more variety at your meals. Don't settle. So if you like something, eat it, and if you don't like something, don't eat it. Uh, it's one of the um, saddest things when one of my clients comes to me and says, you know, I'm eating this food because I heard it was good for you, but I really am not enjoying it. I just force it down. That's no way to live. Um, and also we know that the different methods of cooking and preparing foods can really change the flavor of food so you might like it better. So definitely experiment with that. And checking in, does it still taste good throughout the meal? Remember that taste satiety we talked about. We really want to be paying attention to that. So up until now, we have been talking about tools that actually encompass mindful eating. So mindful eating is really, in simplest terms, about increasing our consciousness during mealtime. So being present when we're, when we're eating or drinking. So tuning into our hunger and fullness levels by using the hunger and fullness scale and also um, regaining pleasure and satisfaction with eating, those steps that we just reviewed, are actually ways to help you eat more mindfully. 
So a couple more tips when it comes to mindful eating, and there's so many benefits on mindful eating. I mean, the literature is constantly coming out and there's a lot of research on how it could help with portion control, digestion, we can get more pleasure and satisfaction by doing this. Um, there's been research to show it can help with blood sugar, inflammation, so many different aspects of health. So some, some other tips, checking in during the eating experience to, a, to assess that taste, hunger, fullness, satisfaction levels. I've had, some, I've had a number of people who were restricting certain foods because they thought they were bad and they felt like they were scared and they were gonna be out of control with those foods if they allowed themselves to have them. We've actually done a lot of things I work on is um, introducing foods to, it's, it's part of exposure therapy. So I had one client who was very fearful of being around cheese because she felt like she would just overdo it. And when she actually started to allow herself to have the cheese and be more present when she was eating it and tuning into how she was feeling and eating it in a non-distracted state, she actually noticed it made her feel really bloated shortly after. Um, and she even noticed some acne that tend, she associated with when she had uh, frequent consumption of cheese. So she decided that, wow, I don't even have a taste for it anymore because the you know cons outweigh the pros for me. So it's interesting that the foods we think we might be, or um, we feel out of control with, actually when we're tuning into these, these different aspects of the eating experience, we might find that we don't really like as much as we, we thought we did. Or we might find that we really do enjoy them, but we're able to enjoy them um, in moderation and get a lot of pleasure and satisfaction out of them. So chewing our food, slowing down during meals, focusing on how you feel not only during the meal, but even after. So how does that food sit? You know, does it, do you feel um, heavy? Does your, do you have any digestive issues? You know, how does your focus feel, your energy? Um, there's so many different aspects of how you could feel. And when you can, making space in your schedule for mealtime as an activity can be so helpful. And I fully acknowledge that, you know, we all live busy lives and in this society, it, it doesn't, this society doesn't really promote mindful eating, doesn't make it very easy for us to eat mindfully. But even if there's one meal a week, one meal a day, whatever it might be for you that's realistic, to really try and make that space for yourself to be fully present with that meal without distractions and enjoy. So I do want to mention really briefly that the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program um, does have a free video on mindful eating. It guides you through a mindful eating activity. It's really useful. If you go to the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program website and you click on the Anti-Cancer Living Toolkit and type in mindful eating, the exercise will come up and I highly encourage you to test it out. So last but not least, we can't talk about coping with our emo or we can't talk about feeling out of control with eating without talking about using food to cope with emotions. So it is, it is part of the normal human experience to use food to cope with emotions. Um, but really what can happen is if we're using food as our only way to cope with emotions or the predominant way we're coping with our emotions, that's where we might run into some, some issues. So we really want to find ways to comfort, nurture, distract, and resolve our issues aside from using food. So notice here, I'm not saying without using food, because again, eating, emotional eating, it is normal. It's just we want to have other coping mechanisms as well. And keep in mind, when we eat for emotional reasons, it's not going to help us fix the underlying issue. It may help us feel good in the moment, but over the long term can actually make us feel worse. So now that we've talked about so many different aspects um, to, related to um, feeling more in control of our eating habits, less out of control uh, with our with food and around food. Um, we talked about using the hunger fullness scale, reconnecting to the pleasure and satisfaction of the eating experience. We talked a lot about ditching dieting and why dieting does not work and can be counterintuitive to you feeling more in control of your eating habits. And we talked about a lot about mindful eating. I want to leave you with a quote, one of my favorite quotes by two dietitians that I highly admire, and that is, enjoy eating food, not too much, not too little, and mostly what satisfies you. Thank you.
and I'll share my contact information. So if you're ever interested in learning more about me or reaching out, um, I have my website listed here and my email as well. All right, thank you, Crystal. That was very informative and I'm definitely gonna make a reservation at my favorite Indian restaurant tonight <laughs> for that. Yeah. Um, all right, so if you guys are interested, Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program uh, has approved health coaches and we will send out the link in the follow-up email if you're interested in working with Crystal um, around uh, diet and we also have other approved coaches on there as well. So I'll send that link out um, here shortly. And we're going to move on to the uh, Q&A. So if you guys have questions for Crystal, feel free to use the uh, Q&A uh, chat box that you see or the chat box that you see on the right hand side of the screen. So I'm going to go ahead. We had a couple questions come in, Crystal, while you were mm -hmm. um, presenting. So I'm going to go ahead and, and ask them. So um, the first question here is, I honestly never really feel full. After I eat a balanced meal, I feel hungry again within 30 minutes. I never feel satisfied. I have to decide how much food I'm going to eat or I will eat too much and still not feel full. What, in your opinion, is the reason I don't ever feel full? Oh, that's such a good question. So there are a lot of things that could impact fullness, which I didn't get to touch on a lot in the webinar. Um, but one is medications. We know medications can, can impact our appetite the composition of your meals. So the balance of macronutrients. Um, so that includes carbohydrates, fats, proteins, fiber, getting enough fiber at meals, all of those different things um, kind of work together synergistically to promote feelings of fullness and satiety. So I would definitely consider looking at the composition of your meals. Um, and another huge thing, and there, there's other aspects as well, but something that I see a lot is when we've been out of touch with our hunger and fullness for quite some time, and I'm not sure if this is the case for you, it is the case for a lot of individuals I work with, like if we have very erratic eating habits where maybe um, we skip meals or go long periods without eating and don't really have a set eating schedule, that can actually disrupt our hunger fullness hormones. Um, you know, those satiety hormones, and sometimes it takes retraining the body um, to, you know, really get those hormones back in sync. So something that the literature has suggested is going, trying not to go more than four to five hours without eating if you are someone who has a really hard time tuning into their hunger and fullness. Um, and then I do notice when I do work with my clients on that, that those hunger and fullness signals start to get more regulated, but so many different things can impact those signals, um, including any chron you know, past medical history or chronic health conditions. So it's really important to take a holistic approach with that and, and work with your medical team for sure. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. Um, so just so everyone knows in terms of timing, so it's about 442. So we'll, we'll take questions until um, about 455. So we have, we have them coming in. Um, all right. So the next question is, I've been told sometimes you think you're hungry and you're actually thirsty. Is this true? And if so, how can you tell the difference? Yes. Oh, I'm so that's a great question. So yes, sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, our bodies can be not so great at letting us know when deciphering thirst from hunger. So staying hydrated throughout the day, um, you know, making sure that you're drinking enough water and staying hydrated so that if you know you've been adequately hydrated, then when you start to get those signals, um, then we could assume that it truly is that you're biologically hungry. So I would say first and foremost, making sure that you're properly hydrated. And it can be tricky, especially as we get older. Our um, signals to decipher thirst from hunger actually get worse as we get older. Um, so some of those same signals you'll get from hunger can get misinterpreted for thirst. So something you might consider is even maybe um, if you start to feel hungry and you're like, hmm, I'm not sure if this is hunger or thirst, uh, maybe try and sipping on some water or unsweetened tea and getting some fluids in and seeing if this helps. But if you have gone more than four to five hours without eating, or maybe if your meal wasn't very balanced um, and didn't leave you like a six or a seven on that hunger fullness scale, 
earlier, then you might actually be, be um, biologically hungry. So I would say, look at the rest of your day, you know, how hydrated are you? What, you know, what was the balance of your meals? Did you feel full the last time you ate and satisfied? Um, but definitely hydration as, as number one, keeping hydrated to help decipher those cues. Oh, Seem, I think you're muted. Hold on. Yes. Okay, okay there we thank go. You. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> All right, so our next question is, um, what do you think about intermittent fasting? Um, I know it's, it's I've, I've been seeing that a lot lately, so I'm sure a lot of people yeah. have the same question. Yeah, that's a great question. So there is actually a lot of research on intermittent fasting showing that there's potential health benefits as it relates to metabolism. Um, with that being said, you know, I think that there, when it comes to have, it's really for me, I want to see more of how why are you intermittent fasting? So if someone's intermittent fasting because they want to lose weight or it's another diet for them, like another way to restrict, I actually recommend before trying something like that, we really make peace with food first and promote a healthy relationship with food. Because sometimes if we do something like intermittent fasting, which very well, there are some documented um, studies in the literature that show it could be beneficial. Everyone's different. Certain medical conditions I would not recommend it for. Um, but in general, I would say first and foremost, think, looking at why you might want to do it. So if it's another way to just diet or restrict, I wouldn't recommend it. And if you are someone, like I just mentioned, who does struggle with tuning into their hunger and fullness levels, I do recommend with a lot of my clients that we really regulate and start to get in touch with their hunger and fullness signals first before they start something like intermittent fasting. Because sometimes what I've seen is that doing something like that um, may actually, and every body is different, but it may add more fuel to the fire if our hunger and fullness signals aren't in balance. All right, thank you. Um, so our next question here is, what do you recommend to instill healthy eating habits for children? Oh, so that's something I'm extremely passionate about. Um, there, that could, that could probably be a whole presentation in and of itself, but I'm a big advocate of um, really being a positive role model for them. So, and really um, something that always comes to mind when I get this question, because I do get this, this question a lot, is I remember when I was a kid and now we're learning how this isn't recommended to do this, but when you're told like, oh, you have to eat your vegetables before you get up from the dinner table, or um, you know, you're not allowed to, to leave the dinner table until you eat your greens. Um, so having these rules around food, that actually can promote out of control eating, um, especially as that child grows into an adult. So really trying to um, honor your child's hunger and fullness signals. And the, the good news is that when um, babies are kind of the the best at knowing when they're hungry and when they're full. And they're good at honoring that, and even children. So really, you know, honoring their hunger and fullness signals. And my best piece of advice for that is really just serving as a positive role model for them. And I think the more you can make peace with food, um, you know, and just not being on like constant dieting or talking about restriction and really having a healthy relationship with food, um, tuning into like the, helping them tune into the taste and the flavor of food, foods um, and, and getting them involved in cooking can be really instrumental as they grow older so they have a healthy relationship with food as well. All right, um, so our next question is, let's see. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so somebody asked, I need to lose weight. The only time I ever lost weight was when I was, com when I completely cut carbs, bread, pasta, all of that from my diet. Do you recommend doing that to lose weight? Unfortunately, I did gain all the weight back. Yeah. So I am not a proponent of cutting out any food group whatsoever. Um, we do need carbs or carbohydrates and, um, we, the brain actually prefers to run on carbohydrates. So 
and something that we actually need biologically, and there's different types of carbs. So different carbs affect our body in different ways, and especially when it comes to weight regulation and health, um, all carbs are not created equal. So to completely cut them out as a whole, you're going to be missing out on vital nutrients that you need, fiber, B, B vitamins, the list goes on, um, and it makes it really hard to for that to be sustainable. Um, you know, like you you mentioned that you gain the weight back and that's probably because that, that diet of completely eliminating carbs is just not something that's sustainable because the body also needs and wants carbs. Um, and sometimes we notice cravings can really um, be high when we're on low carb diets because again, the body wants those carbohydrates and really, you know, maybe even a piece of advice focusing on the types of carbohydrates instead of cutting them out completely. Um, carbohydrates from cheese doodles are going to be completely different than carbohydrates from fruit or quinoa or brown rice um, and some other whole grains and, and those kinds of complex carbohydrates. Okay. All right. We have another question, um, and I, I, I do hear this a lot from parents. Um, it's a hard for me to cut sweets from my diet, especially when they are in my house. My family likes to have desserts and snacks around. Can you suggest ways for me to resist eating this junk when it's right in my home? Yeah, so food environment is plays a huge role in our eating habits. So you know, having a food environment at home that maybe has more of those sweets around or foods can make it definitely more difficult when you're you're trying to change your eating habits. Um, I will say I work with a lot of, of parents and individuals who um, sort of feel because of the mentality around these foods, like they're bad, they're not good, I can't eat them. If they are around, I just feel like I'm going to overeat them. Um, sometimes when we start to work on that, the mentality surrounding those foods and break it down, and when you are having those foods, practicing the techniques that, that I was mentioning, being mindful when you're eating them, paying attention to the taste, how it makes you feel, um, there is, it is possible, you know, hopefully this is my my glitter of hope for you that it is completely possible to have those foods around and not feel um, then you know not have this fear that you're going to overdo it with them or that you're going to have them every day if they're around but sometimes to get to that point um, it can be helpful to work on the mentality around those foods and also you know modifying the food environment at home could be helpful um, which can be done in a variety of ways depending how on board the family is so there's a lot of factors that come into play. Good question. Though. All right. So we have, um, a, this is a pretty specific question, mm -hmm. um, but in terms of uh, lactose intolerance, uh, somebody wants to know what's a good alternative for yogurt. Um, and maybe, I don't know if you want to pull up your email again, but um, maybe if people have specific questions about um, products and things like that, they can, they can email you if it's an extensive answer. Yeah. Um, there are so many products on the market out for individuals who are struggling with lactose intolerance and a lot of people um, I find don't do well with dairy um, by, you know, especially if you struggle from with digestive issues. So there's even yogurts made out of almond milks, made out of coconut milk. Um, there's even lactose free organic yogurts out there. I would encourage you, especially these non-dairy yogurts, um, just always look at the ingredient list because um, sometimes there's a lot of fillers and additives and gums added to them. So if you could um, pick one that has the least ingredients possible. Um, I'm not going to recommend any brands right now, but just know that there are um, these non-dairy yogurts definitely out there. Um, def take a look at the ingredients, make sure there's no added sugars in them. Um, I know there's like cat ones there's two popular ones I'm thinking of are um, made from almonds. So made from just made from almond milk and then also made from coconut and even cashew yogurt as well and getting plain if you can so avoiding like the sweetened ones and maybe sweetening it yourself adding your own fruit or whatever it might be and going with the plain good job okay all right so i think we are uh, getting close to time so mm -hmm. i'm going to go ahead and uh close out the webinar thank you so much uh crystal today for your presentation it was very very informative 
Um, and then if you don't mind jumping ahead, I will go ahead and um, send out the link to everyone where uh, they can find the course. If you guys are interested, we have, again, um, a course available at anticancerlifestyle.org where you can find um, the entire course. This is just kind of a, uh, a sample of what type of content we provide. Um, and I just want to say thank you again, uh, Crystal, and thank you to our attendees for staying on uh, this whole time. And we will see you on our next webinar. Thank you all so much.